but I do want to go because I, I think using this film as a good example of what we're talking about. So if you wouldn't mind, I mean, using this film as a way, because I, I, know, I know that when you talk about here, I just want to point through this part. I really like this this introduction because you're like, uh, the Navi were to be blue, tall, muscular, sleek, and feline. So the Navi, of course, are the, the people, the the tribe, the alien tribe that, you know, that are trying to protect their planet or their moon, I guess it is, from from uh, humans, from excavating and exploiting it, right? So they had to be alien enough to be plausibly otherworldly, but take a form. The concept artist, Jordu Shell, recalled Cameron stipulating that the audience has to want to fuck. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it because he's like, among other things, that this... is so that is so pre me too, isn't it? That comment. <laughs> no, I love it because it's, even it gets... even that is like you know, ten years later, that seems like a different world. I know, but it's so good because it's it's you're saying exactly what it is because, uh, you know, you you point to the fact that when they were designing the characters, making the prototypes for those characters. Uh, Shell, this this designer, this concept artist, he had pinned up pictures of beautiful ethnic women, quote, beautiful ethnic women to ensure that his feline aliens would reflect the ids of teenage boys who made up the key, the film's key demographics. And I know I've been quoting your essay a lot, but I think it's such a poignant essay. And I think what you there's so many great points in this thing that I just want to highlight it for people so people can read it because it's such a good essay. Um, but you but, you know, you start this essay off talking about something that we can all kind of relate to you know you're not talking about john zerzan or some picasso painting or you know something that maybe is a little bit more in the past a little more distant or maybe on the fringes of western society's um consciousness and our understanding of say primitivist ideas you're you're getting to something that has been you know one of the highest grossing films of all time and i think a big part of why it was so attractive to people and why, like I mentioned, there was an avatar depression. It wasn't just the visuals. It wasn't just how stunning it looked, but it was this sense of disenchantment that you point to, um, that you just mentioned earlier, disenchantment with the world. Like we don't feel that the world is sacred anymore. We don't feel that there is this natural awe-inspiring wonder that just exists. I mean, we live, oftentimes many people live in cities and in urban environments. Um, we don't, you know, I think a lot of our um, evolved reward systems in our biological bodies our bodies themselves we don't feel a lot of we don't get a lot of that feeling anymore that i guess we imagine that pr- so-called primitive people would feel from being about the world and understanding how to live in the world in a more integrated and and um uh, i guess more connected way and so when i think that film came out I guess I just want to ask you, like, if we can use the film as a way to sort of structure this idea that we're talking about here of of racializing, because there is a racialization of primitivist, within the primitivist uh, philosophy, prim- primitivist ideas that we've been talking about. So if you want to use that film as an example to sort of convey that idea to the listeners, that would be fantastic. I think that um, that's actually an extremely um, astute account of um avatars appeal that uh, after 20 30 years of um, a high degree of skepticism about that kind of idealism primitivist idealism um and not just in you know specialized academic conversation but also i guess more broadly uh, a kind of postmodern cynicism that movie came in and it said this primitivist set of instincts it's really powerful out there that we there's a sense that we're destroying something really uh, that's absolutely essential to our sense of who we are and what we ought to be. Uh, and we're going to play on that and we're going to pull in the id of these young boys that um, go uh, to the mall on the weekends uh, and watch blockbuster film. We're going to pull in their desires and channel it through this very ancient narrative and what could be more ancient uh, in scriptural cultures and oral cultures than the idea of an originary natural condition and the and the whole journey of restoring that if you look at christianity islam uh, judaism they're all based on the adventure of restoring eden and that's what um, Avatar did. It, it told, in a sense, uh, an almost biblical narrative, um, but one that was realized through science fiction, where 
here is this Edenic planet, Pandora. I mean, there's a similar planet in Star Wars, isn't there? <laughs> and <laughs> I won't argue that, mm -hmm. that this is repeated in blockbusters. But here is this Edenic planet, and it's about to be crushed by who else but our, us, mm -hmm. the people who are watching this movie mm -hmm. <laughs> in the mall in some um, uh, highly artificial constructed suburb um, in the middle of, uh, you know, an American and suburb. Uh, we, are con we are destroying this Eden, and you will go through this journey with Jack Sully, the US Marine, as he encounters real nature, bonds with this other self, this natural self, the Navi people, makes love to the most beautiful Navi woman modeled, as you said, on quote unquote, beautiful ethnic women, mm -hmm. uh, and beyond, um, you know, that kind of white dominated settler colonial um, post-industrial society. Uh, and you will be able to experience this visually stunning world created by CGI and 3D and everything. And you will come out um, feeling like you've come into contact with something really essential and important. And you're absolutely right. Cameron doesn't care about cliches and he doesn't care about repeating these narratives because he knows that this is going to touch people and it's going to sell a lot of movies. And I think what your listeners, uh, if they connected with that film or if they at least found that film compelling, what they will recognize is that in spite of aforementioned postmodern cynicism, and the sense that everything is discourse and constructed by the way we talk about things and permeated by the history of colonialism and racism. Nevertheless, this desire, this desire for, for an originary natural condition still has a massive pulling power in our present. And I guess that's the thing I would say to um, people who are thinking critically about this for the first time is not simply to say, well, look, you know, here's kind of patriarchal, racist set of ideas. Therefore, this whole form of idealism is inherently bogus. I would say if those ideas or that impulse is something you can understand and connect with and, on, and something on which you want to act to save the environment or whatever it might be, I think about, well, what do you do with that impulse? And how do you translate that impulse and that idealism into action of one sort? Uh, and I think that's where um, the conversation ought to go rather than one being about is primitivism um, bogus or is it uh, legitimate? <laughs>